Hello, health seekers. Welcome to another episode of the Keto Pro Podcast with myself, Richard Smith. Today, I am joined with the amazing Dr. Zoe Harkum. Zoe is one of the world leading experts, researchers, authors, bloggers, and public speakers in the field of diet and health. Zoe, welcome on board. Thank you very much for having me. Fantastic. It's uh, long overdue. I've been looking forward to this one for, for quite some time. Um, so we, would you like to give, not that you need any introduction, but would you like to give a quick intro in regards to who you are, what you do, and then we can jump straight into some uh, some questions? Okie doke. Um, a lot of people don't know I had a previous life before this one. So uh, potted history, developed an interest in diet and food when my brother was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was a teenager. Um, so that had quite an impact on the family diet and also seeing your brother inject and realizing that insulin and uh, glucose directly for him were kind of equal and opposite sort of started a fascination. Um, then became interested in why obesity was starting to take off because obesity started to take off. I guess, you know, I mean, it, it started in the US earlier than the UK. It was around the late 70s in the US around the sort of mid to late 80s in the UK. And, and that really interested me. Why why was that happening? Because for something to change, something must change. And I started looking then at um, the classic view was you're eating too much, you're doing too little. Uh, did the evidence support that? No, it didn't. Um, was there anything else going on? And then I saw that we changed our dietary advice at about that time. So we changed it in 77 in the US changed it in 83 in the UK. And sure enough, you can just see obesity taking off like an airplane at that time. So unless someone is going to propose a better hypothesis, my hypothesis, working hypothesis has always been that changing our dietary guidelines had an impact on our, our health and our obesity epidemic. Um, went to Cambridge University, um, got a proper job, as my mum would call it, started off as a management consultant, um, worked in the US, came across a lot of books on some really interesting things, hyperglycemia, um, candida, gut flora, food intolerance, you know, those, those were the sort of the groundings of me realizing that food played many roles in our life and that food could actually be really quite harmful to the point that um, you, you could behave like a, a, a drug addict or an alcoholic around food. So, you know, lots of sort of em embedding things going on um, left management consultancy, went to work for Mars, hilarious, um, not the candy <laughs> division straight away. They have got an electronics division, um, which is where I was for three years. But then I moved to Mars Confectionery in Slough. I was headhunted from there by Smith Klein Beecham. So I went from big food to big pharma, wow. um, then got together with Andy, moved to a job. My husband, who's Welsh, Welsh speaking, um, moved to Wales. Uh, so when, what do I do in Wales? Newbridge Networks to start with. Worked for Terry Matthews. Worked for the Welsh Development Agency. Worked for Welsh Water. And then uh, 2009 decided I, I want to make my passion my vocation. And kind of like you, let's walk away from the big salary and the nice security and let's do what I really want to do. And if I can put food on the table doing it, even if I don't have the lifestyle that I had before, then that's going to be happy days. And and here we are, happy days. Um, 13, 14, 15 years on, um, wow. still putting food on the table. The food at that time in 2009 for me was vegetarian food because I was a vegetarian and I had been for 20 years. And then I went to a conference in 2010 because while I was moving into this world and I was exploring and trying to learn as much as I could I was going to all kinds of conferences so I was going to NHS conferences I was going to mainstream thinking obesity conferences asking difficult questions realizing that they had no answers to them so if I was going to get answers um, to them I needed to go and find them out for myself and then find an alternative conferences so I came across the Western Price Foundation uh, got the opportunity to listen to Barry Groves. And I remember texting my husband under the table saying, hey, I'm going to be coming back from this this conference, not a vegetarian. So uh, wow. he, he, and then we since um, got to know Barry really well. I ended up actually speaking at his funeral because um, he was, you know, sort of a, 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 a forerunner in this field. Um, so Andy was forever grateful to Barry because he ended his wife's vegetarianism. Um, so that's the potted history of me, really, from proper job to upsetting people <laughs> in the nutrition world, which is kind of what I do full time now, like I care. Any regrets? 
oh gosh no 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 Good. i mean and no there and there was never really you know we we were really we really cut our cloth so um a lot of people if they try something different they they're aware that the money coming in is very different but they kind of don't adjust the money going out and you, you've got to adjust the money going out big time and then say okay if in a couple of years we're, we're doing okay then you can start going back on holiday and stop buying blue and white tesco stripey stuff and whatever so um yeah if you, if you really want to follow your pa passion and nick hudson talks about this now doesn't he for for ultimate freedom so that you can't get sacked you can't get cancelled by your organization you can't have people um trying to form petitions so that you end up losing your job or whatever or get de-licensed as a lawyer or a doctor or something you, you, you know you're so better off working for yourself so um so that's yeah. what i do pros and cons i think you are 100 percent. it's my wife and I and my little girl haven't been on holiday. Um, we've been on holiday once since she's been born um, because of the cost cutting and uh, the fact of the hours that you work when you are self-employed. But it is something that as a family, we all believe in. Um, I'm a little bit more relaxed when it comes to my little girl. Uh, I wouldn't be. I would be a lot stricter, but it's to avoid arguments within <laughs> within the family and it gets difficult when the little ones go to friends houses and they cook their meals and you think that's you know the the she she's come home not eating any real food yeah, yeah. but then that's that's probably a topic for another day anyway yeah. but anyway i'm gonna share my screen and um i'm gonna throw some questions at you which i'm sure you will be fantastic at answering these <laughs> Yeah, the eat well, that's it. That's your eat well guys. So the eat well plate is the one in the middle way. The, you've now got the eat well guide. So the plate became the guide in 2016, March 2016. And I ended up getting a publication in the British Journal of Sports Medicine because I went to have a look at it and to say, who put this together? I mean, seriously, who? It wasn't actually that different. I did a, um, in, in this BJSM article, I actually went through what changed between the plate and the guide. If you want a funny story, I'll tell you why this, this even happened. Um, so my PhD, I looked at the dietary fat guidelines and the bottom line in my PhD was I found that there was no evidence whatsoever for the introduction of the dietary fat guidelines. And this kind of plate is based on the fact that dietary fat is supposed to be bad for us. So um, my first paper came out in 2015. It was the 64th most impactful paper in any discipline in 2015. Wow. Climate change, physics, education, history, any discipline. S think how many journals are published, articles published each each day, minute, hour. And it was the 64th most impactful. So, I mean, it was wow. it was pretty dynamite. Went viral globally and all the rest of it. And I basically said, look, there was no evidence for the introduction of the dietary fat guidelines. Now, that spurned um, quite a lot of interest from Radio 4. I did something down in Bristol with um, the food programme. I did something at the Abergan Venny Food Festival. Um, Radio 4 then did a programme where they interviewed me. Asim was on the programme. Sam Felton might have been on the programme as well. And then hilariously, they interviewed Dr. Alison Tedstone, who was the chief nutritionist at Public Health England. And he said in this interview... Um, why is there a can of Coca-Cola on your role model for healthy eating? And if you went back to the Eat Well plate, don't do it because you might lose this diagram. <laughs> but if you went back to it, you'd see that there's a can of cola on this plate. So it's kind of why is there a can of cola on your, on this plate? And she said, no, there isn't. And the presenter is like, yes, there is. So I, I hypothesize that she went back to her Public Health England cushy little number nice corner office in London or whatever and just went ballistics like guys I've just been humiliated on national radio why have we got a can of coca-cola on on the eat badly plate as I call it um and and we need to come up with something new so March 2016 out comes the eat well guide I detailed I mean you know the colors changed slightly this was tweaked um the junk you can now see is in the bottom left hand corner it's actually come off the main body of the plate but I mean what do you need to put junk for on a role model plate of healthy eating so I I looked at how did this come about and I discovered that Public Health England 
had appointed a panel of 11 representatives to put together this new guide and eight of them turned up regularly to the meetings, three not so much. And the three who didn't really turn up were the ones who actually could have made it um, you know, quite, quite good maybe, who might have had some integrity, might not have been conflicted. The eight who regularly appeared were all conflicted and five of them were basically industry body reps. So you had one who was the rep for the Association for Convenience Stores. Obviously you don't get any healthy food in a convenience store. Um, the Food and Drink Federation, uh, they're always speaking out against real food on um, on news uh, programmes. Um, what else do we have? The Institute of Grocery Distribution, the British Nutrition Foundation, don't be fooled by the name. That's the who's who of the fake food industry. So think of any organisation from any supermarket, any high street outlet, Starbucks, Costa, any fake food company, Kellogg's, General Mills, Nabisco, Tate and Lyle, any organisation working in the arena of the stuff that you and I don't eat and they were involved in setting this guide and this guide I've got another useful article if you go on my site and put in eat well um, curriculum will probably bring it up I'm pretty sure it's an open post and you'll be able to see because I know you've got a, a, a young girl this has been embedded in the UK curriculum so you learn a particular thing at age five and then age seven you learn something else and then age nine you should be able to do this. And this is just embedded. So our fake food industry has basically embedded how they want us to be eating in our national curriculum. Now, why parents and teachers aren't marching up and down in the street, I don't know, because that is absolutely disgusting to me. And I present this at conferences and I did a talk on Friday. And when you tell them that that was basically designed by the fake food industry, there's always a gasp. And it's like, I don't blame the Association for Convenience Stores. It's their job to do the best by their members. So um, I don't blame them at all. You know, you, you get invited by Public Health England to tell people to eat cereal and bread rather than eggs and natural live yogurt for breakfast. Of course, you're going to take that opportunity. I don't blame them at all. That's their job. I really, 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 really blame Public Health England. I think it's disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. And it hasn't changed. That was 2016. We're now 2024 and there's no sign of that changing and they're not going to change it. They are not going to tell people to eat real food because there's too much money to be made out of fake food. It will never change. That's why we've got to change it from the bottom up and just ignore it. Yeah, spot on. And I'm just looking, I mean, that um, the presentation piece on on there was um, it's it's a fairly close representation on that image, but I can see the differences there. But Okay, it... so go, go back to the eat well, because there's another really interesting thing. And I've, I've, I've done a few posts on this because it's just really interesting. So, you know, I said I used to go along to mainstream conferences. So this is 2009. I've decided I'm not going to be an HR director anymore. I'm going to go and, and just find out everything. I mean, it's fantastic. I'm, I'm not actually working. I've got seven days a week. I've got as many days as I'm, I'm not asleep. And I can just go to conferences, I can get on the train, I can go and meet people. I would just rock up at universities and ask to speak to the head of biochemistry and ask them, um, please, can you explain to me how saturated fat can raise cholesterol? Because I can't understand the biochemical mechanism by which it could happen. And they'd say, oh, we better get someone over from the dietetics department. And I'm like, Jesus, if we're relying on the dietetics department, we're completely doomed already. So you know, don't bother. So I was at this conference and somebody put up this eat well, it, at the time it would have been the eat badly plate. So somebody put it up. So I put my hand up and I said, where do the proportions come from? Um, I mean, that looks like a third, that looks like a third, that's sort of 15%, that's about 12%, you know, where it, the old proportions, where do they come from kind of thing. And the person on the stage didn't know. And a couple of people came up to me in the break and said, Oh, crikey, that was so interesting. You've made us think all the things that we were taught at dietetics school and we don't know where they came from. And I said, well, like what? And they're like, well, five a day. It's like, OK, I'll tell you where five a day comes from. It's got no evidence base whatsoever. You know, I'd already started looking into these um, and you'll find stuff on my website going back to 2009, 2010, where it's like five a day, the myth five a day, the truth or whatever. Um, but they had no idea. So they just sat there in dietetic classes, writing all of this down. Oh, now this is what's really interesting about these proportions. So I wrote to the people who were in charge of the Eat Badly plate at that time. And it was actually the Food Standards Agency. It wasn't Public Health England then. 
And I said, where do these proportions come from and kind of what do they apply to? So they came back and they said they're by weight, which was actually really helpful. Um, they said they're by weight and it's a sort of, it's a visualization. So what we're trying to get you to do is to have about a third of your plate looking like it's full of fruit and vegetables and about a third of your plate looking like it's full of starchy foods, things that make you fat. And then these other sort of things in smaller quantities. So what I then said was, okay, your body doesn't recognize volume. It really doesn't care whether you eat a head of lettuce or a head of steak in terms of volume. What it cares about is what did it get from that volume? So what calories did it get? Fuel. I don't care about calories for weight, but calories are fuel. They're petrol. Your body needs them, but it needs them in a certain form. Then it wants to know how much protein did it get, particularly complete protein, essential fats, micronutrients, macronutrients, vitamins, minerals, all that kind of thing. So you, your body actually registers food in terms of calories, which is why all other government advice is based on calories. So the dietary fat guidelines were don't have any more than 30% of your diet in the form of total fat, which is what drove this high carb diet. Because if you cut fat out of the diet, protein is pretty constant. The only thing that's left is, is carbohydrate. So what I said was, okay, the average calorie of things in the fruit and veg, let's go by 100 grams, your average calories of fruit and veg is no more than 50. Okay, you'll know this. Your average calorie of starchy foods per 100 grams is about 400. Your average calories of those hideous vegetable oil bits in purple there are about 800. Um, and then meat, I mean, you'll notice they've got, you know, no red meat on that one whatsoever. They've got some oily fish, but it's very much out maneuvered by um, plant protein, lentils, beans, baked beans with sugar in for goodness sake, um, nuts, chickpeas, all this plant nonsense. Um, and they'll want the dairy to be low fat. So you can quite easily do it by calorie. And I did that and a really, really interesting thing happens. So they want a third of the plate to be fruit and veg, but by calorie that ends up, if I've got this from memory, probably right, that ends up being 6% of your calorie intake. Now your starchy food that they want to be a third of your plate ends up being 50% of your calorie intake. Now your junk segment, because that is really, you know, calorific and it's horrific calories as well, it's fat and sugar combined, that ended up being about, I think from memory, about 20% of your intake on wow. a daily basis. So 20% is starch, which you don't need, it's just gonna make you, sorry, 50% is starch, don't need, it's gonna make you fat. 20% is junk, which you really, really, really don't need. The unsaturated oils, of course, becomes a really big part. It's not the little slither that you can see there. That becomes quite a, a major part of your calories. They're trying to drive you down the low fat route, the cottage cheese, not the brie from the farm shop and the blue and all that kind of thing. So it just, it turns it on its head. Your body is then basically taking in completely nutritionally deficient calories. So if you go to my website and you put in eat well conflicts, you'll get the post on the people who designed this nonsense. If you put in eat well deficiencies, you'll get the catastrophic nutritional deficiencies. Um, when they produce this new guide, they put up five menus the day they released the guide and they got removed really, really quickly, but I'd grabbed them already because um, it was actually released on my birthday in 2016. And I'm, you know, it's like, this is birthday present. This is super good fun. Um, grabbed them. And I started analyzing them and I've got a friend um, independently. Um, and I say a friend, I mean, I can't remember when I last saw it. It's just somebody I know who I knew, she actually worked for an eating disorder charity, but I knew she had this kind of nutritional calculator that I did. So I said, right, Lisa, I'm doing this with these five menus. Can you do the same? And then we'll compare notes because, you know, which lentils do you choose? Did we choose the same one? You know, we try to go for a stock item run it through the nutritional calculator, tell me what you think the macronutrient proportions were. Um, our agreement was incredible because you just go for the staple lentils, the staple brown bread, the staple brown rice. And the carbohydrate intake of that plate is something like 65 to 70%. The fat intake is around 15%. The protein intake is around 19%. I mean, it's just catastrophic. It's then deficient in all your fat soluble vitamins, obviously, because you're just not eating fat. Um, so A, D, E and K, it's deficient in the B vitamins because you're not getting your meat. 
um, deficient in retinol because of liver and oily fish and all the rest of it's deficient in essential fatty acids. Uh, it's just deficient in everything. It is a recipe for making people fat and sick. And this is what they're telling everyone to eat, whether you're diabetic, young, old, two years old, 92 years old, obese, underweight, going through chemotherapy, trying to run a marathon. This is what you're supposed to eat. I mean, it's just... I hate them. I hate them. It's, I hate them with passion. I do. It's, 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 it's criminal. It, it's, it, it is. You know, this post office woman that everyone's ganging up against at the moment, make this woman head of public health England, or what is it now? It's even more scary. The UK, I'm looking over here because people don't know. We, we've ended up over here as little icons. So I'm looking at you over here. Um, uh, this, I mean, it's now what the UK Health and Security Agency. I mean, how the hell scary is that? I don't know. Um, but it's still, to all intents and purposes, the body that is looking after public health in England. I'm based in Wales. You're based in Wales. Wales and Scotland and Ireland, they're just lazy. They just follow England. England comes out with this BS and Wales and the rest of them just, just follow it. So shoot the people who appointed the fake food industry to put this together. Yeah, you're right. It's I agree. It, it's criminal, but... Because this information comes from um, establishments that we trust, it's very difficult to break any belief that the information they are providing is incorrect. Um, I mean, th that plate, you know, as you just described, it predominates carbohydrate, particularly from grains. Um, it has the lower end of protein. Uh, we're told to avoid red meat and eat leaner cuts such as chicken. Uh, we're told to avoid saturated fats and we're told to replace those saturated fats with vegetable oils or seed oils uh, and we're told another thing which isn't on there but we're told to avoid sodium uh, because we're told that it leads to increased risk of cardiovascular disease but we i mean let me just go back to this screen because i've got a couple of other bits on there but the the, the next slide there is is my interpretation of of the macronutrient split and a uh, what I used to think was a healthy meal on a plate cooked in vegetable oils. Um, and then the image there shows uh, the trend from the 1950s, from the average size of a woman and weight with uh, and man from the 1950s to 2023, increasing over time. Uh, so are we listening to this information? This, this information that, that we are told to, to go by, are we listening to it? Well, the saturated fat intake, fat intake is down. The only fat intake that's, that's up comes from the vegetable oils. And when we look at uh, meats on the bottom, meat, red meat in particular, has come down. The only meat that has increased is, is our poultry, our chicken, the, the, the meat that we're told to consume. Now, what has increased are the cereals and the sugar. So we, we are doing everything that we have been told. So, I mean, and that is usually a, a common a common answer to, to this question. People think that, well, people are not following the advice given, but we are. Everybody is is following this advice and it clearly isn't working. Diabetes is through the roof. Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, cancers, all of these things are through the roof. Whatever we are doing is clearly not working, which is a, a point that you made before we, we opened all of that up there. So what is the answer? What can we do to change the outcome. People Ignore are sick. It. <laughs> Ignore <laughs> it. I mean, <laughs> I, um, I mean we, I've, I've had this debate. I've been working in this field now for 15 years. So, you know, think of a pyramid. Um, and at the top of the pyramid is the public health dietary advice. Now, the quickest way to transform the health of the nation would be for public health to change their dietary advice um, and make it much more aligned with what you or I would advise people to do. That's not going to happen. I mean, there's still... People fighting to make that happen. Um, I admire them. Maybe somebody's got to do it, but it's it's not going to happen. It's just not. It's just not. Um, whether it's a waste of time or whether at least you're putting them on notice, I don't know. You know, I admire a lot of the stuff that Nina Teicholz does over in the US because if you can change the US dietary guidelines, they would filter across into other countries. Um, but in my life, that, that's not going to change. That's that's my belief. Um, so you've then got the bottom of the pyramid, you've got what we're doing, which is the bottom up revolution, which is people who themselves find themselves obese or find themselves type two diabetic or maybe neither of those, but just find themselves not feeling great and feeling addicted to food and constantly struggling with highs and lows of energy because they just can't keep their blood glucose even. Um, you know, a lot of people just don't realize how 
how ill they feel on a daily basis until they change their diet and, and realize how well they can feel. Um, doctors will tell you that the most common reason people walk into their surgery is they, it's called TAT, T-A-T-T, -T, tired all the time. Um, and people walk in and say, I'm tired all the time. I'm never tired. Um, you know, at the time I go to bed, I'm ready for bed and I put my head on the pillow and I'm fast asleep and I wake up in the morning and I realize my hubby is awake and we just start talking to each other immediately. We're just like, bang, we're just, you know, we could give a presentation in that moment. There's no time taken to, to wake up. And then throughout the day in between, and I eat a lot more carb than keto people, but just way less than the government would tell me to eat. My blood glucose is even, so I don't get energy highs and lows. I don't get dips. I just feel okay all the time. Um, and that spreads. Uh, it's quite contagious. So you see somebody, I mean, people would have seen you and like, oh my goodness, what did you do? You know, you lost my weight. <laughs> you lost the equivalent of me. Um, people would, would have said, you know, how did you do it? And then they want to give it a try. People like me, you go to a conference, you discover that there's another way, you try it, you feel amazing. Um, and and the, the desire to eat this rubbish food, because they make it really, really attractive. You know, I used to work for Mars Confection. I know how attractive they try to make that food. Think about this. If you haven't gone that route yet, despite knowing how amazing that is and how tasty it is and how good it makes you feel, it is a, is a high, you know, maybe not Oxycontin, but it is a high. Despite knowing all of that, you don't go back to it because you feel so good not eating it. Now, that that tells you that what what you could feel like if you actually went that route is is really, really quite amazing. So that that's us. We're, we're the bottom up revolution. Um we're growing all the time, but we're making a small impact, which is why we're that bottom of the pyramid. Where we've got the most opportunity, sort of about midway up the pyramid, and that's if you can in influence doctors. So every time you get a doctor like David Unwin or like the people who work at the PHC, Joe Reynolds, um, Tony Hinton, Renee um, Hunderkamp, whatever, every time you get somebody who works out that that play is really not healthy for people, they can influence 100 patients, 1,000 patients. Um, I went to give a talk on Friday. I normally only talk if it's a few hundred people, but this was um, tens of health professionals. And that's worth it because you can convince even one health professional in that room, they will see probably 100 to 200 people over the next few months and they can impact all of those. Um, so that's the level that excites me. It's the level where doctors wake up and realise we can't just keep telling patients to eat less and do more um, and, and looking at them as if they're lying or they're greedy. Um, and, and a lot of them are not lying and they're not greedy. They're food addicts and they're just eating the wrong things. If they ate the right things, they'd be satiated, less hungry, craving less stuff and everything would start happening for them. Yeah. And I myself, I, I can attest to that because my I don't track I don't track calories. I, I count occasionally in order to show people because they don't often believe when I tell them, but I eat now more than I ever have before. When I was clinically obese, um, I would eat less than 3000 calories per day, around 2,700, predominantly from carbohydrate. Mm. And I became clinically obese and very unwell. Some days now I consume as much as 6,000 calories. Um, Yes, calories carry energy. Um, how a calorie is is accounted for was was through the, the measurement through the bomb calorimeter, isn't it? Through through photons, through heat. But the effect of that calorie is different depending on what food you're consuming it from. And I don't believe that it's calories that govern whether we gain or lose weight. I think it's more of an endocrine uh, issue. It's our hormones that govern, particularly the 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 the, uh, the effect of of insulin. If we elicit an instant response, we signal the body to store fat that upregulates lipoprotein light bears, which breaks the bonds on the glycerol backbone, puts fatty acids into the fat cell, and it blocks hormone-sensitive light bears, the enzyme that we need to, to allow us to burn that fat. So it's this, it's this activation of insulin and other associated foods. Um, now, when we my, my diet used to predominate from grains. I used to eat what I believed to be healthy. I would eat my pasta and my muesli with a, a chopped up a banana in the morning, you know, yeah. my muesli with a banana. You know, it's, but uh, if I look at the caloric value in that, you know, it. for example, let's say it was 500. 
Um, it isn't just the caloric value because if I were to eat bacon and eggs, which contain the same caloric value, what that grain or that cereal contains are lectins. And lectins will bind to insulin receptors and they'll signal the body to store as much as five times more fat than that caloric value itself. So if we were to compare the bacon and eggs to a bowl of cereal, that insulin response is going to be five times uh, more effective from, from the grains. So it's we can't count the calories. The caloric model doesn't account for the effect of insulin, the thermic effect of food, metabolic rate, ketogenesis, inflammation, all of these other things. Um, so I think we need to come. It's not a case, as, as you say, of being more active and eating less because that just leads us to being hungry and not wanting to move as much. And that's exactly the position I was in. I wouldn't I'd starve myself all day. And then when it came to being more active in the night, I didn't have the energy to be more active. Um, now, I gravitated towards removing as many carbohydrate as I could. And I'm not anti-carb. And I think that's an important point to make. As you say, you still consume carbohydrate. I think there are other levers to pull. But when we look at that plate, it predominated grains in particular. Um, and I think when we are filling the plate with grains, we are reducing the volume of the most important um, source of nutrients, which I believe to be animal proteins. Mm -hmm. Every cell in the body is made of protein. Every cell in the body is made of fat. Yet we're, those are the two things that we're told to fear, fat predominantly more than anything. So cholesterol, you know, we come on to avoiding the saturated fats because we're told to reduce our cholesterol. And we're told that the vegetable oils or the seed oils will, will reduce our cholesterol, which they do mm -hmm. um, artificially. Uh, the phytosterols in, in the, the seed oils will artificially lower our cholesterol. This is why when somebody begins a low carb lifestyle or removing the seed oils, they see an elevation in cholesterol. So they'll go to their doctor and their doctor will say, well, your, your cholesterol has gone up. That cholesterol has just returned back to its natural physiological level. It, it hasn't increased this because the phytosterols were artificially lowering. But every cell in the body is made of cholesterol. It's essential for cell formation, cell communication, nutrient absorption, nutrient transportation, the production of hormones. It's essential for healing. We can't live without it. So why? It doesn't make sense if you take a step back and think, well, why are we reducing something that is essential for life? And when we consume animal proteins, we are consuming all of the vitamins and minerals that we need from the animal protein and the, the natural fats. So what what are your thoughts on cholesterol? What should we be, should we fear cholesterol at all? Is there an upper limit? Um, should we be promoting cholesterol? Um, should we be avoiding the seed oils? I think I already know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to look this shaft of sunlight coming in actually which is I was just missing my eye anyway I was trying to trying to move it but it's just not happening it's too far away anyway um I mean you've given a good summary there I've actually done an academic paper um if you google Harkham Baker plant sterols my um supervisor was invited to do an editorial in the Journal of Biological Sciences. So he just said, I was doing my PhD at the time. And he said, oh, hey, Zoe, can you write something for this? I don't even think he read it, but his name's on it as well. So I wrote um, exactly that, the, the impact of plant sterols on cholesterol. And of course, the important thing is, is it an end good outcome? Um, yes, consuming plant sterols will reduce your blood cholesterol because plant sterols compete in the gut with your human cholesterol and replace it to an extent but what does that do to the end outcomes, which are cardiovascular di disease, mortality, and so on? And the research that I did, trying to look at all the evidence, all, albeit in a very short editorial, it's very readable, 800 words or something, um, was that the impact on end outcomes was bad. Um, so if you look at um, not just did it lower your cholesterol, but did you then have more heart instance in the groups where the cholesterol was lowered? Yes, you did. Was it more mortality? Yes, it was um really not something that you want to be doing uh and you're actually absolutely right i mean i i i remember reading malcolm kendrick's dr malcolm kendrick's the great cholesterol con back in 2007 and he throws out a challenge and he says um how does saturated fat raise ldl cholesterol and he said boy does that make me a hostage of fortune but i can't even see the mechanism by which it can let alone that it does which is what led me to go into universities to say hey can I make an appointment with the head of biochemistry or whatever because I'm I, I want to understand this so let's get the diagrams out of the human body um let's prove him wrong let's you know let, let's have a look at this kind of thing and, and they couldn't even explain to me 
the basic mechanism by which lipoproteins are made. Um, the confusion between cholesterol and lipoproteins is, you know, is is one hundred percent. Um, when you have a doctor saying to you, you know, your good cholesterol is this and your bad cholesterol is this. I mean, seriously, just stand up and move to the edge of the surgery and just start banging your head against the wall um, until they take back what they've just said. Because it's, it, you know, we're talking lipoproteins here. We're not talking cholesterol. Um, cholesterol is utterly life vital. You die without it. If statins, statins impair the production of cholesterol in the body, they don't stop it completely if they did you take a statin and you drop dead it'd be that immediate and dramatic um i have joked on occasions that maybe that would have been a good outcome because then we wouldn't be messing around with the mevalinate pathway but that doesn't happen they impair it rather than stop it um and they think that's a good idea personally i don't think that's a good idea but i'm not making 239 billion or whatever it is out of one statin called lipitor so my frame of reference is slightly different to to those who want to to lower cholesterol yeah it's i work um i work with a lady who is a neurophysiologist and one of her colleagues uh treats dementia patients one of the first thing that she does is takes them off statins mm. because of its ability to to increase through block in the mevalinate pathway um which i coming back to that i mean i think there might be a mechanism there which you know, increase in saturated fat or the production of ketones, they share that pathway just before the mevalinate pathway. So it, it, I, I guess it might even be possible to to do so. But is that such a bad thing? So my my cholesterol last time I checked was uh, double figures, ten point two six. My LDL was eight something, and um, I I I was disappointed because it wasn't higher. <laughs> it, um, LDL is protective. LDL heals the body and repairs the body. The body wouldn't create, to me, the body wouldn't create something that's going to cause harm to itself. And coming back to what you said in regards to the, the, the phytosterols, the plant sterols, the body competes for those and, and it preferences, but the body is always trying to excrete those plant, those plant sterols to the point where it, it will keep a very small amount within the body and there are certain groups of people who suffer with a condition called cytosterolemia and their body's inability to, to excrete that remaining uh, plant sterol. And they have a massive increase in risk of cardiovascular disease. And it's there. And you, you can Google that. If you Google cytosterolemia, it's there in black and white. And the whole, you know, the, the whole hypothesis in regards to consuming these foods to reduce cardiovascular disease is, is just silly because it shows in black and white, if these plant sterols are increased, then it increases our risk of cardiovascular disease. I think many people come in to see me in regards to healthy eating are incredibly worried about consuming red meat because of the, the fat content uh, and raising their cholesterol. And they're also concerned about cancer, um, you know, which is at, at the IARC released a report in 2015 uh, headline in that um, red meat causes cancer, which, you know, I'm sure you've ripped apart. I have. <laughs> Brilliant. Can we yeah, go through Google that? Google it on my site. I did. And there was one in 2018. I think. I mean, it just it put red meat in on my search box. There's so much. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So I think w within that, there was over 800 studies that they looked at, wasn't there, in 16 um, that they put forward. And basically the outcome was zero of those actually showed any correlation. Yeah. I think in some of the, the studies used, they were injecting rodents with carcinogens in order to, to promote, you know, a, 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 a cancer effect while feeding them red meat. The whole study is is ridiculous. And But the headline, and I think this is a perfect example in regards to, if you were to speak to a doctor, typical doctor, they would just read the headline instead of reading um, the report themselves. And the amount of studies that I have read where the headline does not mm. match the, you know, the the results and the conclusion um, are baffling. But it's what why why do you think this is happening? And it's why are we why are we guided down this way? Why are we told to eat these foods in order to make yeah. us unwell? Yeah, I mean, just before we move on to that, just just to clarify. So one of the um, sort of slide sequences that I slow show in presentations is I take a 
um, from the USDA database, I take a slab of steak. So I take 100 grams raw steak just to show people what it is. So you've got to imagine a picture of a steak. And then your next slide is 71% of that steak. I then color blue because it's water. And then about 21% of that steak, I color yellow because it's protein. And then there's a sort of 1% of black, which is minerals and ash. And then you're left with seven percentage points, which is actually the fat content of that steak. And of course, saturated fat is not even the main fat in steak. You'll know that it's monounsaturated fat is the main fat in meat. Um, all food that contains fat contains all three fats, monounsaturated, saturated and polyunsaturated. So the idea that one is bad and one is good is just absurd. Why would nature put them all in all the foods that contain fat? And people say, oh, meat is full of saturated fat. So 2% of that 100 grams, so two grams from the 100 grams, 2% is saturated fat. So it's not even full of saturated fat anyway. Um, oily fish has got more saturated fat. Oily fish has got more fat. But you tell us to eat oily fish, but you tell us not to eat red meat in the name of fat. I mean, it's just none of your advice makes sense when we hold it up to scrutiny. Um, so why does this go on? There's only two reasons why um, the wrong thing is ever said. There's only ever two reasons. One is incompetence and one is conflict. And it can be a bit of both. Um, usually in the field of food and pharma, it's conflict. Um, you're not trying to tell me that some somebody at Public Health England couldn't sit down and go, oh, do you know what? I was just looking at the pack of a packet of steak that I picked up in, they shouldn't buy in Sainsbury's, but they do. So then they can actually see the nutrition label. Um, oh, you never guess. It's not even full of saturated fat. Blow me down. It's mostly protein. And then it was mostly monounsaturated fat. Did anyone else know that? And then you'd think, oh, everyone else at Public Health, Health England would go, oh my goodness, that's amazing. Well, we must get out and correct all the advice that we've been given over the years. It's not incompetence. Um, these guys are super conflicted. And the fact that they're working with the fake food industry to let them design our role model healthy eating just shows it's about conflict. So follow the money. You know, the money is in drugs. The money is in fake food. The money is in make them eat cereal. Don't let them have yogurt or eggs. Make them have ready meals in the evening. Don't let them have meat. God forbid, let them go and shop at the butcher because then they actually establish local networks and maybe don't need the supermarkets, which is where we want them to go, because then we can sell them all the other messages that we'll be trying to sell them. It's, it's a whole massive agenda. It's it, to me, it's conflict rather than incompetence. And the same with Harvard. Um, you know, in Harvard are constantly churning out these epidemiological population studies. They're not stupid. I mean, they might not be the smartest. Um, you know, I, I'd like to think I could give them a good run for their money on any kind of nutritional analysis, but they're not they're not stupid. Um, and yet they keep churning out this complete nonsense saying red meat is associated with cancer. Well, you know, that might be the fizzy pop that you have with the burger or the burger bun or the fries cooked in the vegetable oil. But trust me, if you're going to compare you and Sean Baker and people eating grass fed beef from the local butcher um, with people who then go on to get bowel cancer, I know where I put my money. Yeah, it's... <clears throat> heavily financially driven yeah. unfortunately and one of the questions that i get asked quite often when i put this forward is well why why does the government and these other establishments tell us to eat five fruit and veg a day if they were so determined for us to make money uh or, or, to, or to make money off selling a product because in their eyes if you were consuming fruits and veg fr fruits and veg are incredibly healthy um how is that going to make me sick? Because th that that's that's a saying, isn't it? it um, there's, there's no profit in a healthy patient. So if we can, the pharmaceutical companies and, and the sugar industry, one makes you sick and the other one offers you a medication in order to, to make you better. Um, so why are we told, why are they pushing the five fruit and veg a day if, the, um, if this yeah. were true? Yeah, I, I mean, that one is actually quite interesting. So that one started with conflict but I actually think that one has become incompetent. So again, going on my site, put in five a day, the truth or something, I traced it back to 1991. It's trademarked, not many people know this, five a day is trademarked by the American National Cancer Institute. 
and there was a meeting held in California and I've got a list uh, in the post of the organizations that were at this meeting and it was organizations that would benefit from people consuming more fruits and veg. So it was the Potato Foundation, the Blueberry Association, some logistics companies that would make money if we moved more fruit and veg around the United States. McDonald's was in there, which kind of really, it's like, why are they involved? Except they're probably involved in anything, food and just, just wanted to be there. And I don't know this because I wasn't at the meeting. Um, but I would hypothesize that they have a good meeting with people who've got an interest in us eating more fruit and veg. They get to the end of a good meeting. And I've been a lot in a lot of business meetings like this. And somebody says, right, we've had a good meeting. We need an output. What are we going for? What are, what are we going to take away from this meeting? Make sure that this meeting has, has been productive. And some bright spark says, well, you know, how about we started a campaign just to get people to eat more fruits and vegetables every day? Because that's going to help all of us. Blueberries, potatoes logistics companies we don't mind it's going to help all of us um and somebody would say great idea should we set a target and people say great idea what should we set oh i don't know three mm, not very ambitious seven oh, a bit too ambitious five number of you know digits hey people can count to five let's go for it five a day trademarked by the national cancer institute who were at that meeting and suddenly we've got five a day and then you've got five a day coordinators that work in public health you've got i call them five a day tooth fairies you might as well be a tooth fairy for all the evidence base that there is in five a day but i think it just then became one of those things like eight glasses of water a day like 14 units of alcohol like one pound equals three and a half thousand calories which of course it doesn't and you won't lose a pound if you create a deficit of three and a half thousand calories all of those just when I went into looking at nutrition, when I realized that everything was just a house of cards, trying to find where these things came in, the origin of some of these things was really quite difficult. Um, and I remember listening to the head of the National Obesity Forum, um, Tam Fry, and he was doing an interview in a program on Radio 4. And he said, oh, five a day was invented in the back of a taxi in Brussels by two people talking, you know, well, what, uh, how, you know, what should we do five a day? Da, 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 da. And I remember thinking, no, that doesn't stack up because you haven't realized that it's trademarked by the National Cancer Institute. You've not referenced this meeting. Your taxi ride is after this meeting. It's like, no, I'm sticking with what I found on that one. But if somebody approached me on my blog and said, do you know what? I found an article in a 1940 government magazine in, you know, Australia that said five a day. Great. I'll, I'll revise I'll revise my post and say, okay, that's where I think it came from. And These I think numbers are just plucked out of thin air, but then people believe them. And that dietitian at the conference, or the group of dietitians that came up to me, who said, "Oh, you've made us think. You know, all this stuff we've just been taught that you, that we never question. Like, why, why didn't you question it? Why don't people question things? Why don't I don't get that? You know, you do when you're four. Why do you stop doing it? Yeah, I agree completely. And and that's the difference I think between. Um, people such as yourself is that you're not wedded to a, an agenda. Your agenda is optimal health and well-being and the truth. So if you are presented with a paper that questioned any of your beliefs, you would happily look at that paper and look into it and and break it down. Uh, whereas I think people from the other side of the coin will always look for the epidemiology studies to back up their belief rather than looking for the truth. I'm in this for optimal health. I want to be as fit and as healthy as I can. I want to live as long as I can so I can be around with, you know, for my daughter. I want to be the best athlete I can. All of this comes with living the lifestyle that, I, that, that I'm living now currently. And I, and I believe that to be one of the healthiest ways to live. Um, but I, I also think when it comes down to the veg, that if you were consuming five lots of fruit and veg a day, it doesn't leave an awful lot of space on your plate for animal proteins. So by default, we're removing the one food that is carrying all of the nutrients that we need. Um, but people think that it's full of nutrients. And, you know, we, we've alluded to this a little bit later on, but a little bit earlier on, but vegetables don't contain an awful lot of nutrients. They don't contain vitamin A. You know, as we said, vitamin A in, in fruit comes from beta carotene, which is a precursor that needs to be acted upon by an enzyme called BCMO in order to convert it into retinol. But to do so, it's depleted by nearly 21 times, making the amount actually converted close to zero. B vitamins, 
almost non-existent. Pyridoxine, vitamin B6, cobalamin B12 does not exist in plants. Um, vitamin D does not exist in plants. Vitamin C we can get from animal proteins. Vitamin K, vitamin K in, in if you pick up a pack of kale in the supermarket, it, it, there's a stamp on there that says high in vitamin K. Wrong it's, <laughs> it's K1 and the human body needs K2. Exactly. Yeah. Um, creatine, choline, carnitine, carnosine, all of these things we can only get from, from animal proteins. Um, and I think by consuming lots of these vegetables, one, we're not consuming an awful lot of vitamin and, and minerals, but we're also consuming excess amounts of fiber, which is an anti-nutrient. Mm -hmm. You know, we're told to, to consume lots of fiber um, and I know that this is a, a big topic for you. Why don't we need fiber? Well, we don't need carbohydrates. I mean, at, at the top level, the simplest argument is um, you've got three macronutrients, fat, protein, carbohydrate. They're essential fats. They're essential proteins, which means things that we must eat in those two categories. There is no essential carbohydrate. And then you look at what fiber is. Fiber is a subset of carbohydrates. So within carbohydrate, you've got your monosaccharides, single sugars, disaccharides two sugars polysaccharides many sugars fiber technically is indigestible many sugars so it's a subset of carbohydrates so if there is no essential carbohydrate and that's a nutritional fact i know people don't like it and i i sometimes have to caveat i'm not saying don't eat carbohydrate i'm saying that you don't have to there's a big difference in that um and fiber is a subset of carbohydrates so if there's no essential carbohydrate there's no essential requirement for fiber and yeah I did this talk on Friday and really interesting for me I was on my feet for nearly three hours because it was a, a medical professional group they're really interested they you know seemed really keen for me to go along it was a great session I really enjoyed it as well really challenging questions um really good interaction interacting among themselves as well and starting to challenge each other you know really high level session um but it's interesting to watch the things that most get the sharp intake of breath. Um, you know, so you show them the Eat Badly plate is sponsored by the fake food industry. That gets the intake of breath, but it's it, they're on your side. They're like, oh, wow, didn't know that. Right, you've got me there. Um, but the one that has the different intake of breath, which is no, I'm not buying that. Um, fiber is a massive one. Um, they talk about lowering cholesterol and you say, why do you want to lower cholesterol? I mean that, you know, they almost fall off your chair like, well, okay, now I know you're really being stupid. You know, you obviously believe that the earth is flat or something. Um, and fruit not being all that, you know, that the, the point you say fruit is essentially sugar and water with a couple of nutrients, but really not that many. Um, it's those three, it's the cholesterol, it's the fiber and it's the apples. And trying to say, you just don't need fiber. And then they start coming back at you. Oh, what about your microbiome? It's like, you don't need fiber for your microbiome. You know, I'll list you 10 other things that are going to help your microbiome and that have got absolutely naff all to do with baked beans and sugar on toast. Um, but you just realize what a fantastic job the, the narrative has done. Um, you know, stop a hundred people in, in Queen Street, in Cardiff or whatever, and ask them a few nutritional myths and probably a hundred will say, yeah, cholesterol is really bad for you got to lower your cholesterol probably a hundred will say yeah fat is really bad for you and particularly that saturated fat whatever they won't be able to tell you what it is or where it's found but they'll tell you that it's bad for you um yeah eat your five a day drink plenty of water all of this has, has gone in and they would not be able to tell you why they can't answer the next question which is the way that you you start knocking down these paradigms when people start spouting the narrative nonsense then you say to them you know, how does that work then? How does saturated fat increase LDL? Because I still don't see how it can. That'd be a debate for another day. I can see how unsaturated fat lowers it, but I can't see it the other way around. And who gives a flying fig anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, I agree completely. It's um, fiber and cholesterol, I think, are the two main ones that that I seem to get a lot of, um, a lot of pushback with. But, you know, when I ask people why they consume fiber, it's for my gut microbiome because fiber breaks down into butyrate, which feeds the colonocytes in the gut. But butyrate isn't the only form. We can get isobutyrate, propionate, and isovalinate from from animal proteins. These these other uh, these other uh, molecules can can 
allow us to to create butyrate through through different pathways. And the beauty is that when we are ketogenic, even in a non ketogenic state, that butyrate still breaks down into beta hydroxybutyrate, which is the ketone body. So just by being low carb ketogenic, you're feeding every colonocyte in the gut, regardless. But the fact that we can get the fiber from from animal proteins, if we think of protein as being animal fiber, then there is no real need to consume any fiber from from plants. But it's just we have been brainwashed, I believe, since you know the 1950s onwards, isn't it, in regards to healthy eating? And I think it's you're right. It's going to be an incredibly tough task in order to, and I don't think we'll ever change establishment, mm. but I'm hoping things like this will get the word out there because I've, I've worked with, with clients who suffer with insulin resistance, diabetes, all the way up to cancer. And every one of them that has stuck to the advice has either seen a, you know, a, a massive improvement or a complete resolution. All of these things are connected insulin resistance and inflammation, they come from the foods that we eat. Some of the foods that we eat are highly toxic, particularly from the seed oils. The grains that we are told to consume every day cause this intestinal permeability, which leads to autoimmune disease. And there are other contributing factors, uh, but grain seems to be the main predominator. Mm -hmm. But it's, if, so we, if, if you were to give three pieces of advice for people moving forward where they wouldn't have to think too much in regards to what they are eating, but enough just for them to make an educated decision on a daily basis, what will your three main tips be? Well, that's actually quite handy because I have three rules when it comes to what should we eat. So I actually do a presentation called What Should We Eat? Um, number one, eat real food. Um, I'm not into fake products, keto or not, sorry, but I like eat real food. Um, and you, people should know what real food is. You know, cows graze in the field, pepper army sticks don't, fish swim in the sea, fish fingers don't, come on. Think about the form it arrives in nature. That's real food. Um, number two, choose that real food for the nutrients it provides. If you do that from a macronutrient perspective, you'll be majoring on fat and protein. And if you do it from a micronutrient perspective, you'll be majoring on fat and protein. And we're talking animal fat and protein here, obviously, because um, that's where you find the micronutrients and the macronutrients. And then the third one that I say is... Um, uh, eat a maximum of three times a day if you don't like breakfast don't eat it um and you know okay if you have four times a day because your particular lifestyle goes with it but i mean i say unless you are a cow or want to be the size of one stop grazing because people are just grazing all day long and wondering why they're gaining weight you never give your body a rest you never stop insulin being kicked in you never give your body the chance to get the equal and opposite of insulin glucagon to actually start breaking down fat and doing what it wants to do um so eat real food choose it for the nutrients it provides and eat a maximum of three times a day love it absolutely fantastic brilliant stuff zoe where can people find you 